Amen. Well, the next four Friday nights, we're going to have two sessions each night. This first session, I want us to see, the first two sessions actually, I want us to see the big picture of what the Lord is saying to us. I want us to really capture the big picture. Because I want to see the urgency and sobriety about where we're going. And the big picture is exciting, but there's some real challenges in it as well. You know, I have about 25 hours of good material to share. Therefore, many things cannot be communicated in these few sessions. Let's look at Roman number one. This is real brief. I do this every time, but I feel like it needs to be said. We don't base our ministry on prophetic words. Our ministry is based on our relationship with Jesus and the Word of God. But look at here, 1 Timothy 1, Paul told Timothy, according to the prophecies given to you, wage war. Prophecies are given, prophetic promises are given to inspire perseverance in our prayers, our faith, our love, our humility, because... The assignment that the Lord is giving you related to the pro prophetic promises is challenging in the flesh. And people will be tempted to quit because it's challenging. That's one of the main reasons he gives dramatic prophetic promises. Paragraph B, you know that prophetic promises are not guarantees, but they're invitations. They're invitations. That's why prophetic promises are part of the fuel of the prayer life of the church. Paragraph C, I want to be real brief on this. I'm not going to cover everything I wrote here on the notes. Because I emphasize this so often, but just in case you're new in our midst, the Lord is raising up an international family of affection. He wants the whole church to love the whole church. Our glory isn't our assignment. Our glory is the Lord Jesus and the global body of Christ and his assignment in it. Paragraph D. I'm not saying this with mock humility. We're one little small movement. There's thousands of movements around the earth, and the Lord wants us all working together. So I share this story for us to encourage our obedience and perseverance. But also, I'm trusting that people that will hear this online, that it will encourage them in their ministry assignments. In these sessions, I'm going to be more telling stories in the spirit of prophetic declarations. What I mean by that, there's many pastoral issues that need to be addressed, but I'm not going to take time in these sessions to address them. I want to in my... Pastorhood, I want to stop going, yeah, 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 but this, because people get afraid or people feel left out or people feel proud or people drift away from the word of God. And I don't, I want to address those, but not in this series here. We'll do that in personal settings and small groups. I want to give a, stories that are prophetic declarations that touch our spirit that move us. Well, I'm going to highlight in this first session two men that God sovereignly chose for this storyline. Now, these two men are flawed. Well, they're both with the Lord now, so they're doing great. But during their time on the earth, they were flawed and fallible. I don't want to make any excuses for their failures. I don't want to diminish their failures. They had real failures that caused me and many others much pain. But I also don't want to diminish the work of the Holy Spirit through them that God himself confirmed. He didn't confirm it to honor them. He confirmed it for the sake of you and multitudes coming after you. The Lord says, I'm going to confirm it not to honor these men, but to stabilize and strengthen many that are coming after them. When I look at their lives, I see the weakness, I see the brokenness, the disappointment. 
But I look at the surpassing grace, uh, riches of the grace of God, that God used such men like this to create an incredible line of testimonies all over the world in the last 30, 40 years of people's lives. Many leaders, many non-leaders radically changed. They love Jesus more. They love the word of God more. They're more persevering in their obedience to the Lord. So I'm not excusing, I'm not making any excuses or apologizing is what I'm trying to say for use it for receiving from the Lord through these two men who were flawed. But they were not only flawed. They had a tenacious sincerity for the Lord as well. So it's Bob Jones and Paul Cain, obviously. Let's look at Roman numeral two. Just a real quick background. I'm going to give a, li a little bit on each one of them. Because the way the Lord used them will make more sense to our storyline if we understand the way the Lord used them, meaning our storyline will we'll be able to interpret it in a better way. Just real brief on each one of them. Bob Jones grew up in the hills of Arkansas. He was born in 1930. He had two angelic encounters in his youth. One at age nine. He told the story many times. An angel stood in front of him on a dusty road in Arkansas and blew a trumpet. Said it scared him to death. He did not understand it. Didn't say anything to him. Blew a trumpet. Then at age 15, something like that happened again. He couldn't make sense of what it was about. I look at it as the Lord put giving a token in their early life before they obeyed or failed to obey, saying, I've sovereignly set you aside. And he would draw on those encounters many years later. Bob Jones didn't get saved until he was 39 years old. He didn't have his first revelation until he was 45. I know some of you in your 40s, you think it's over. He hadn't had his first vision yet until he was 45. He worked a full-time job spraying trees and cutting and spraying trees for the insects, except until he was 58 years old. Yet he was prophesying much in between, but he didn't, quote, go full-time until he was 58. I'm saying that. Because a lot of folks think that if they're not replacing Reinhardt Bonnke by the time they're age 30, that the bus passed them by. It's nothing like that. When I first met Bob, paragraph B, he spoke of, the very first day I met him, he said, I've had over 100 visions or dreams, revelations about this youth group. Of course, I didn't believe him when he told me that. I, I looked at his outward appearance. He had on overalls that were a little bit dirty. He had a winter coat on and it was about 60 degrees outside. It was a prophetic sign. I'll talk about that more next week. Bob worked closely here in Kansas City with this ministry for about 10 years and then he moved to the East Coast. It's those 10 years, but particularly, not only, 1983 and 84, was a series of remarkable, supernaturally confirmed encounters that were verifying what would happen yet in the days to come. And Bob said when I first met him, he said, the Lord let me know these things will come to pass after my time. He goes, I won't see many of them. I'll see the beginning stirrings of them. I'll be with the Lord and he told me, I was 27 at the time, you'll be one of the oldest people in this movement when, they, when it comes to fullness. I was 27. I thought, man, I probably will be 40 by then. <laughs> I highlight in these testimonies, these nights that we're covering these, about 25 of the encounters, the experiences Bob had. I, I have never actually counted the number. But he gave me hundreds of words. I heard hundreds. But if they were not supernaturally confirmed to me, I didn't reject them. I just put them on the shelf, and I didn't pay attention to them. So I have hundreds of words. Probably a lot of them were true. I don't know. Unless the Lord, I like to say, went out of his way to confirm it, I kept it at the table. I didn't take it to my heart. 
A number of words Bob gave were confusing to me, to be totally honest. He gave some words that didn't come to pass. It's words that he gave when he would confess later. I just got talking too much and I couldn't be quiet because people would stand in lines for hours to get words for him. And he said it was just so hard to resist the temptation to not give them a word because they were so disappointed. He goes, so I just did my best, and that's where he made his errors in those kinds of situations. The thing I appreciated about it, he was always honest about it. When I think about those early years, I mentioned this before, five times I had a prophetic encounter or a dream, and the very next morning, Bob contacted me, and I told nobody the dream or the vision. I haven't had that many in my life. And the very next morning, he called me and said, I saw the dream last night. I saw the vision. I mean, mine were always things that I saw crystal clear in dreams or a, a supernatural encounter that was non-mistakable. And he would tell me I had it. He never missed it. Each of the five times he did that, it was exactly what happened the night before. And as I said at one of the other meetings that he didn't give me words for my personal life. When I went to him for personal direction, he said, I don't know, I'm not getting nothing. You have to reach to the Lord and walk by faith like everybody else does. He goes, these words aren't for you. He said, they're for the young people coming after you and for their children coming after them. I always understood that. That's why when people would say, well, that's Mike's deal. I go, I promise you, it's not my deal. And the words aren't my words. He said very clearly, therefore, the young people, many of them are not yet even born. This is in 1983. He goes, it's for them and for their children. But it will be very challenging to stay steady. I talked about the prophetic signs. There's five of them in the early days and a few more later where he gave a, him or Paul King gave a vision or a dream and then declared what would happen in the heavens or on the earth, meaning the weather patterns. And with precision to the day, he said, this will happen on this day. The rain will come exactly on this day. In three months from now, the rain will come and verify the word I just gave you. It's really hard to prophesy the day the rains will come in the midst of a drought. To the day. And the point wasn't about the rain. The point was about the prophetic word. Like he said, he said, I'll give you a vision and a dream, and I'll give you a sign in the heavens of the earth. And when the earthquake comes on the very day that I say it from the Lord, you'll go back and reconsider that dream. That's why it says signs, uh, dreams and visions and signs and wonders. They confirm the dream and vision. You don't need a sign in the heavens. But when you have one, you are mandated to pay attention to that word, and the responsibility is far higher. Some folks have said, because there's actually seven different ones that I've identified where the word was given and the event was prophesied and to the day it happened. People go, wow, how exciting. I go, I think you're missing the point. There is an increased responsibility and mandate to participate and not draw back in difficulty if God confirms it at that level. This happened multitudes of times, this next thing, in the early days with Bob Jones. I would meet somebody, or I was going to meet somebody, and he would call me up and tell me about it, even before I had the knowledge that I was going to meet that person. It happened many times. And I thought, what is this about? And, and the Lord was making his point. He goes, I'm strengthening your faith because of the the challenges and the difficulties in this movement that will unfold, you need to know with absolute certainty, the Lord is saying that I'm zealous for what I'm promising to do. But it will be a long time before it's all fulfilled. I remember one day I met two Presbyterian pastors. I saw them at a coffee shop, and surprised I knew one of them, and I go, hey. And the guy goes, hey, you moved back to Kansas City. I didn't even know you were in Kansas City. And I talked to him, and I'm telling these two guys about Bob Jones, these stories, and they go, can we meet him? I said, a little bit joking, 
He probably knows I'm meeting with you right now. I didn't really mean it. They laughed. I said, Let, let's, let's just do it. Let's call. So I get the phone. I said, now, I didn't know I was going to see you today, right? I haven't seen you guys for years. Right. So I pick up the phone. I go, hello, Bob. They're standing right here, the two guys. I go, yes, yes, okay. And I hung the phone up. They go, what was that? I picked it up, and Bob says, two of them? I said, yes. He goes, Presbyterian pastors? I go, yes. He goes, bring them over. <laughs> and I told him, I go, now, you guys, I didn't know I was going to meet you, and I didn't say anything. And when I went there, he gave them such clarity about their life. I remember this happened a number of times. Uh, a godly man came to me, and he was counseling me. I mean, with great sincerity. Dial down this prayer thing. You have to be more practical with people. It was good counsel. If there wasn't an assignment that was very specific for our future. And he gave me a few things, and I thought, that sounds good. The guy dropped in my office. I didn't know I was going to meet him. Bob calls me a minute, a five minutes later or whatever. A few minutes later, he said, did you just meet with a righteous man? I said, yeah, I think, yeah, he's righteous. He goes, the Lord told me he gave you counsel. I said, yeah, just a few minutes ago. He says, throw it away. It was his sincere human wisdom. He has no knowledge of the mandate that's unfolding in the future. Matter of fact, neither do you. Throw it away and stay steady with what he told you to do. He says, that man can't figure it out. He's a righteous man. And you don't have enough discernment to know what just happened. But the Lord showed me the vision. That happened a number of times. I mean, it was, it was remarkable. I remember one time I met him in the morning and I was going to a citywide pastor's meeting. And he said, hey, I had the dream this morning. You're going to meet an African and he's going to ask you for $5,000. Give it to him. The Lord's in it. I said, I don't have $5,000. He says, you better give it to him. You just do it. I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I go to the meeting. An African man comes to me from Nigeria, has an accent. He goes, could I meet with you? The Lord told me to come to this pastor's meeting, about 50 or 100 pastors. I go, yeah. I go, what, what's the situation? He goes, the Lord told me a man would be here that would give me $5,000. I went, oh, my goodness. I go, yeah. And he goes, man, you're generous. I go, no, I'm not generous. I'm terrified of the Lord. He said, I'm not that generous. I didn't really say that to him. That's what I thought. I remember he got up one day in August in front of the body. I didn't like it when he did this on the microphone because we had protocols, and they were good protocols, actually. He grabbed the microphone one time in, in August, and he said, I remember. He goes, October 19th, it's going to be a day where God is shaking America. He's trying to get the attention, but many won't listen. I go, what? What's October 19th? He goes, I don't know. Some political, economic, military something. I heard it audibly. In October 19th, 1987, the stock market fell 500 points. I understand it was the biggest decline since the Great Depression in 1929. Then he comes to me right there on October 19th. He says, I heard the audible voice again. He said, in February, and I used to mix the data, but he gave it to me real clear. February 21st, he says, it's going to happen in the church. I go, what? He goes, I don't know. I heard it audibly. So February 21st comes, and Jimmy Swaggart confesses his sin and goes around the whole world. He had that kind of specific foretelling with accuracy. That happened. Those kinds of things so many times took place. My point being, I was paying attention to him in a very, very specific way. Paragraph C when I met Bob Jones the first day, and we'll talk about that more next week. I'm going to be very brief on this. He said, you're an intercessor. And I thought, well, we got prayer meetings every night. For four, our church was only four months old at that time. We had prayer meetings every night, seven nights a week. By the grace of God, the Lord helped us to do that the whole 17 years of the church till I helped started. We had prayer meetings every night by the grace of God. But we started those first four months. He goes, you're an intercessor. I go, well, that didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. We have prayer meetings every night. And he goes, you're a youth pastor. You know, and I've told you the story. I go, youth pastor? No, I used to be. He goes, oh, no. You're not mature enough to be the youth pastor God's calling you to be. 
He goes, it's many years from now. He goes, you're way too immature to be the youth pastor I'm talking about. It's a little bit disconcerting. Top of page two. I'll explain a little bit more of that later, but I just want you to get the feel of it. The first and very dramatic encounter he had, Roman number three, is August 8th, 1975. Say August 8th. That's a date. I'm not going to break it all down in, in these next sessions, but that date has come up over and over again. But I, that, that's just pay attention to August 8th. That's just in the storyline. He has a death encounter. I, I mean, a death experience. He hemorrhages, bleeds to death, or the doctors would call it a near-death experience where his spirit left his body and he stood before the Lord. And his body appears to be dead. Now, I don't know medically if it's dead or it's near death, or, but his spirit was gone. He stood before the Lord. And he was very perplexed why this was happening. And when he stood before the Lord, the Lord says, I'm going to send you back to your body because I want you to touch some young leaders of a new movement I'm going to raise up in Kansas City. So Bob's, this is 1975. This is seven years before I moved back to Kansas City. And Bob's very perplexed. And the Lord told him, he goes, there's going to be a third world war. I'm going to bring in a billion new believers, new souls into the kingdom, a great outpouring of the Spirit. So Bob comes back, his spirit comes, the Lord sends him back, and his spirit comes back, and he's looking at his comatose, dead, or near-dead body. Again, depending on medically, I don't know exactly how you say it. He says he was dead, but, you know, he says, my spirit was out, trust me. He goes, that was looking horrible when I was staring at it. And two angels were there. And these two angels were prophesying one to another about Kansas City and about what was going to happen in the nation. And so in the combination of what the father told him and what the angels said, I'm just going to give you a couple of rapid fire statements that I'm not going to read it from here. I got a little bit of it written down there. I'll have more of it written. I've got it written in other places. But he said this, this is what he came out of this encounter with this revelation. And he told me this the very first day I met him. I just thought he was absolutely living in another world. He actually kind of was, I guess. <laughs> the Lord told him a third world war is coming. The Lord, between the standing before the Lord himself and then hearing these two angels, the Lord showed him there's going to be a temporary disruption of the national government of America. He says there's going to be a temporary disruption. There's going to be foreign armies on our soil in various places for a short season. Again, he's telling me this. Right off, like, what do you mean disruption of our national government? He says that's exactly what's going to He goes, I won't see it in my day, but you'll see it in your day. He goes, why do you care about it? Because this prayer and worship movement is critically related to these realities for your children and their children. But you've got to understand it's real. And many in the body of Christ will not be paying attention even when the pressure increases. But understand it's really going to go there. And if you're prepared and the, prayer, the spirit of prayer is on the church, not just in our midst, but everywhere, wherever, we have clarity from the Lord as to what is happening. We can be at peace and have confidence while many will be in confusion. He said there'll be great famine around the world at that time. But he said, I'm going to use Kansas City, not only Kansas City. By the way, these words could be said for some other cities, not most cities of the earth, but there's other places a similar work of God will be taking place. He goes, I'm going to raise up, the angel said, Kansas City, the Lord's going to raise it up as a breadbasket for the world. And in a time of famine, in a time of drought, because the intercessors, Bob's hearing all this. Again, he's not in his body. He's, he's about to enter his body. He's hearing the angels say, in a time of great drought that will come to this nation and there will be famine across the earth, God will send the rains in this city. 
and even across the Midwest because of intercession. And the angel said, because of intercession, I'll send the rains, and the Lord will raise up Kansas City as a breadbasket in the Midwest. And it will be a breadbasket of food, of sur surplus grain. It will be a gift that will be a supply to many places around the world. But it will also be a resource for spiritual bread. He says the word of God is going to come out of this place. It's going to raise up young prophetic voices that have clarity. And it will be a great resource to many people around the world. He hears these angels are talking like this. The angels said that there would be supernatural finances in this area when in many places, not every place, this will be true of other places too, but not most places. I don't know where else. Only the Lord knows that, but he says there will be great economic privation and lack, but there will be supernatural finances where in other places there are no finances or not sufficient finances. He said God put the wheat in the, in the Midwest, like he put oil in the Middle East. And he's going to use the wheat of the Midwest, like the oil of the Middle East, strategically to shift things in the nations. But he's going to connect it to night and day prayer and obedience to what the Spirit is saying. He goes, this stuff won't just happen automatically. It will be in context to entering in and pressing into what the Lord's saying. He saw at that time the Lord said there was a banner over this city and over even the Midwest, he said, a 500-mile radius around the city, a banner called prophetic and intercession. And I said, what does that mean? He says, the Lord showed me there would be an abundant increase of prophetic and intercession in this city in the years to come. Well, already we've got a nice down payment in 20 years. The team did the calculation over 20 million man hours of prayer in 20 years of IHOP in our four prayer rooms. 20 million man hours. I, that's an increase of prayer, I guess. I mean, that really sounds like it's, I don't, I think that's just the beginning of the beginning. He talked about our assignment to Israel. He talked about the billion souls. And the first day Bob lays all this out to me, the very first time I meet him in those dirty overalls with that jacket on when it's about 60 degrees outside, his hair disheveled, talking in a Hills of Arkansas accent. He goes, once I was born again, once with a T, born again with a D. I saw technicolor visions from then on. Get this guy out of my office. I, was, I had no idea this day would change my life because I had no value of the day when it was happening. That's how it happens sometimes, isn't it? I look back, I go, ah, why couldn't I have been more appreciative of what was happening? I didn't enjoy it at all. It was like, Ugh. And then it became entertaining. <laughs> Bob uh, tells me, and I've said this over and over, he says, you're going to see, when you move over to Grandview on Harriet Truman's property, we're over in Overland Park in the wealthy part of Kansas City, you'll be there, I said, as I've said the story many times, our people don't really shop there. He goes, oh, they will, I promise. You'll be on Harriet Truman's property. He goes, at that time, They'll perfect a abortion pill. This is 1983. He's telling me this. He understood this in 1975 in that encounter with the Lord. They'll perfect an abortion pill. They'll sell over the counter. And I said, you can't have an abortion with a pill. He goes, it's going to happen in the future. He says, at that time, there'll be singers and musicians on Harry S. Truman's property. And you've heard the story. All over the rice paddies, all over Asia, they'll be watching the singers and musicians on Harry S. Truman's property on unplugged TV sets. Of course, he was talking about smartphones, you know, f near 40 years ago. He says, at that time, the homosexuals will come out of the closet. They'll be parading in the streets with the support of governments around the world. I couldn't understand anything he was telling me. He says, and God's going to grab your heart in this whole movement and connect you to his salvation purposes for Israel because they are deeply connected to the return of the Lord as king of the earth. Israel, we'll talk more about that as we move on. Top of page three. Let's look to Paul Cain for just a few moments. Well, born about the same time, they were a few months apart. 
similar to Bob, an angel visits Paul when he's eight years old. He has a childhood visitation. And the angel promised Paul a number of things about his future ministry related to the prophetic revelation. And when he was eight years old, he began to move in words of knowledge when he was eight years old from that day forward. When he's about 20, I might miss it by a year or two, he had a 12,000-seat tent as a 20, 21, 22-year-old traveling across the America and going to other nations as well because his word of knowledge and miracles was so dramatic as the Lord promised him when he was eight years old. He had a 12,000-seat tent. He was on TV in the 1950s, one of the few guys on TV because that's how much attention and favor that was on his ministry at that time. Then he, went, he was, uh, uh, one time he went to Karlsruhe, Germany, and they had a tent. I might mix the numbers up, but I'm quite sure I have it right. A 17,000-seat tent, something like that. And a co- he was there for se- uh, oh, it was 17 nights he was there. But uh, several of the meetings, there were 30,000 people. He's just a, a young preacher in his early 20s. I met, I went to Germany in the 90s and met some elderly men. They said, we were at the meetings in the 50s when Paul came, came and 30,000 people, incredible creative miracles were taking place. I talked to four or five of these men. They're in their 80s, I suppose. And they're telling me these stories with delight that Paul Kane is back at Karlsruhe, Germany, because we had a conference there. They were so excited. And I looked at Paul. I go, this really happened. He goes, of course it really happened. Because he told me the stories about that. When he was 30, the Lord told him to pull aside, pull away. And that's a big story. And for 25 years, he lived in Phoenix, and he calls them his near silent years. From about age 30 to about age 55, just in that general time frame. So Paul Cain was off the radar. Everyone was asking, where did he go? I met elderly men when I was uh, traveling with Paul. And they said Paul was one of, the, one of the most talked about evangelists, healing evangelists. And he disappeared. Nobody knew where he was. For 25 years, he was, just, he was in Phoenix. Again, called him his silent years. I tell you the story. I've told the story before. But I'm driving from Phoenix to Anaheim to go to a John Wimber conference in June 1984. And my friend Augustine, who I talk about sometimes, he goes, have you ever heard of Paul Kane? I go, no. No, who's he? He goes, Paul Kane, because Augustine was good friends with Bob Jones. Augustine had a very strong prophetic ministry as well. And the Lord used him in our midst, but I can't comment on everybody God used. I only have a small amount of time. But did some remarkable things in our midst. And him and Bob were very close. And he goes, there's a man named Paul Cain has so much more specific revelation than Bob Jones. I said, I doubt that. Because I'd had, you know, five dreams. And the night, the next day Bob called me. Bob told me who I was meeting and what was happening. That happens, I mean... 10 or 20 times, I mean, just a lot of times, these different categories of activity. And I said, and Augustine was telling me uh, maybe an hour or two of Paul Cain's stories. He goes, you've never seen anything like it. He goes, I saw, I went to a couple of his meetings. He goes, it was of another level. So, wow, so we pull over to the McDonald's on the California State line right there in Arizona. We we're standing at McDonald's, and he's talking. He goes, now, Paul Kane, this, Paul Kane, that. And the guy in front of us turns around and says, did you say Paul Kane? And Augustine goes, yeah, why? He goes, you mean the evangelist Paul Kane, the healing evangelist? He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't know what ever happened to him, Augustine said. And this man, Reed Grafke, goes, I'm his assistant. I, I can't believe you know of him. He goes, I'm telling my friend Mike Bickle all about him. And so he shakes my hand. Reed gives me his card. Said, he would love to meet you, but he's, you know, he's kind of been waiting on the Lord for many years. I took the card, and I felt this was so special. I thought, wait a second. What's the chances of hearing about a prophetic guy that supposedly has far 
stronger revelation than Bob Jones, which I did not believe. And that at McDonald's, the guy's in front of us. What's the chances of that? So I took the car and I go, this is potentially a holy and a sovereign moment. I don't know, but I think I threw the card away. No, I really did. I said, I don't want to mess with this one. If this is God, he's got my address. He knows where I live. You know, that's what David could tell you. God has the most up-to-date database. He found David on the backside of the hills of Bethlehem, a little teenage guitar player singing love songs to God, and the prophet found him. God can find you. You don't have to, you don't have to wave lots of flags. I threw the card away. And all she says, why? I go, no, this might really be God. I don't know, but it might. Well, lo and behold. So three years go by. Let's look at paragraph E. Three years go by. And as a leadership team in our church, we had maybe 20 pastors and itinerant ministries, some, some number like that, 15 or 20. The Lord so stirred us that we needed greater prophetic revelation. So in April 1987, we got together. And right here in paragraph E, I didn't know this was Paul Cain's, one of his primary messages was that God was going to raise up what he called Joel's army, people that walked in the spirit of Joel chapter 2, fasting and prayer, dreams and visions. I didn't even know that Paul came was, that was one of his primary messages. Well, anyway, we gather together, the 15 or 20 of us, we go on a 21-day water fast together. We all committed. I said, listen, if we're going to do this, we're all doing it together. We're going to be in the prayer room, something like six hours a day, all of us. And we're going to just pray Joel chapter 2, look at this. You know the verse, chapter 12 to 15. Fasting and prayer, blow the trumpet of Zion. We're going to cry out because verse 28, afterwards God will pour out dreams and visions. And we had Bob Jones and some others, but I said we were stirred. We wanted if Bob Jones is giving us true words, Bob would always say there's a prophetic anointing coming so far greater than what I have. Bob Jones talking of himself. He goes, you're... You're really blown away how God's used me. He goes, what's going to happen to your sons and daughters and their sons and daughters is so much beyond what's going to happen to mine. It's going to happen right here in this city. Not only in this city, but it's going to happen in this city. There's a banner of the grace of God, an abundant grace decreed over the city of prophetic and intercession. Prayer's going to go forth in this city and prophetic revelation to your sons and daughters and your grandchildren in a way you can't even imagine. So we said, okay. You know, we're thinking we want to see the breakthrough in a year or two, not, you know, it's been 36 years when Bob Jones and I first met him. I was thinking it would be five years. Now I understand why the prophetic encounters were so intense because the journey is so long and the obstacles are challenging. But when you look back, you go, but Lord, you were zealous to show their, your commitment to these things. And again, now I understand years later, you have those kind of encounters because the journey's long and the obstacles are real and the temptation to quit is very real. So we have this Joel 2, cry out to God, 21 days. I mean, a 21-day water fast, a handful of you have been on those, probably a bunch of you, those are rigorous. We're on a Daniel fast right now, right? Starting Monday, 21 days. I like the Daniel fast, but anyway. We're praying dreams and visions. I mean, we're repeating it over and over and over and over again. Well, the fast is over 21 days. You know, we're just exhausted. The next day, I have a, a man from Birmingham, Alabama, calls me and persuades me. I'm just wrung out anyway. I don't want to have a bunch of meetings, you know, in the church. And I said, I just need some coasting time. I'm just so burnt out right now. I'm so tired. So I said, okay, I'll come to your meeting. She goes, there's going to be about 50 prophetic people here. I think it'll just bless you. You don't have to say a word. Just come and sit and listen. And that sounded great after a long fast. Just to do nothing but just veg and listen to other people. So I go to this meeting. There's about in Birmingham in April 87. By the way, I'm in paragraph F. 
And uh, the guy gets up and says, you know, it's a small room here. Most of you don't know each other. Why don't you turn around and say hi to the guy next to you? So I turn around. I go, hello, my name's Mike. And, and the guy goes, my name's Paul Kane. I went, <coughs> <laughs> I go, what his assistant said three years earlier at the McDonald's, I go, the healing evangelist Paul Kane. I don't know what you call him, you know. The healing, I've never called anybody a healing evangelist, but that's just, he goes, yeah, how do you know? I said, oh, my goodness. I go, why are you here? He goes, I don't know. I don't know anyone here. The Holy Spirit said, come to this meeting. It'd be very important. I said, I just finished a 21-day fast with a bunch of leaders crying out for dreams and visions. And I look at him, I go, can we just maybe skip the rest of the evening, go talk, or right after the meeting, leave early? And I want to know you. And he goes, well, thank you. I goes, I can't find many people who want to know me. He goes, I, he was really touched. I went, I got a story he didn't know about. So I talked to him, and I, I've told you the story before, that uh, we're sitting in the restaurant, and we're ordering food, and then he says this strange sentence. He goes, we're in the aisleway. He goes, can we go over to the corner? I go, where food's all on the table. He goes, yeah, but I'm really tired. I'd like to go to the corner. I go, tired. Okay. What, okay. Well, how is going in the corner make you rested? <laughs> I mean, I didn't want to be overly inquisitive, which is a little bit my nature. He goes, well, he goes, I'm in the walkway here. He says, the lady serving us, she's got kidney problems. He goes, the guy over there, he's in a div divorce. He's in pain. The guy over there has uh, sexual issues, real uh, struggling with it. I just want to get out of the walkway. I said, really? I go, let's go pray for him. He goes, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I go, well, why would God tell you if we're not going to pray for him? He says, well, he goes, I get lots of these. They just come a lot of times. And the Lord told me that I was his friend. He wanted me to know because he knew. I'm not supposed to act on all these. I said, what? So the lady comes to the table. I said, ma'am, you got a kidney problem or what, you know, whatever organ there? And she goes, ah, who are you? What are you? Doing? And I go, wow, that's intense. And she wasn't very happy about that. He goes, well, who are you? How do you know? What? So I go to the table while we're moving the food over. I ask the man, I go, hey, uh, my friend over here wants to pray for your marriage. He goes, how do you know? I'm going through, this is the most terrible trouble in my entire life ever. I looked over the guy with the sexual issue. I go, now nah, I'm going to talk to him. <laughs> I just went over and I said, what? So I come back. Paul says, hey, I'd love to come visit your church like right away. So I come back. I am excited. I, I don't know where it's going. I just, I saw those three or four of those words in the restaurant, but I heard the stories from three years ago from Augustine telling me all these grander stories. And I never even brought those up to Paul. I just let him do, I just asked him some questions. And, but I had those stories in my heart and I came back excited to tell our team, I found this guy that I think is going to be a blessing, or I, I didn't find him, hardly did I find him. I ran into him. But it, Bob comes when I come back, where he gathers, he goes, I had a vision. The Lord says he's sending a prophetic messenger here that has 12 times the revelation I do. Now, no one even knew I met Paul Cain there. I go, what do you mean? He goes, the Lord told me he's sending a guy here. He's going to show him to us very, very soon. He has 12 times. I don't know how you get that kind of number 12 times, 10 times, 8 times, whatever. The I don't get all that. But I said, Bob, this is remarkable. I met a guy, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, yeah, that's the guy I'm telling you about. That's one of those meetings Bob saw before I told him. I go, this is real. He goes, yeah, oh, this is really real. So Paul comes. We're out in the parking lot. We, we talk about it in here, right here in this building. In the parking lot, he says, uh, on his way in, he sees an open vision. And in the open vision, he saw Joel's army in training over this building. And he comes in the building, and he's, tre he's trembling nearly. I mean, he's, 
oh my goodness, oh my goodness. You know, the people came because I said, hey, there's this guy Bob Jones thinks is, you know, remarkable, prophetic. So people were very curious, you know. But Paul was more disrupted by the vision. He goes, you don't understand what that means to me. I go, Joel's Army Training, that sounds pretty cool. I go, you know, we just did a Joel chapter 2, 21 days prayer of fasting for increase of dreams and visions. I go, that's kind of, that's something we like doing, especially when it's over. You know, we like this. <laughs> he says, no, I've had this vision of Joel's Army. He goes, I have two primary visions. I've seen them over and over and over again. I've seen the stadiums filled with signs and wonders. I'll tell you that, but that, about that in a minute. He goes, you don't know about my stadium vision. He goes, I've seen it over 100 times, like a movie screen out in front of me. I'm absolutely sure it's the clearest thing I've ever seen in my life. And connected to that vision is Joe's army being trained, meaning people who are embracing the fasted lifestyle, believing with intentionality for the dreams and visions and the breakthrough of power of a whole nother level far beyond the book of Acts. He says, I've had this vision for many years since my early days. He goes, I've been in a hiding in my, he called it in hiding sometimes. And then, then he said, my near silent years for 25 years. I've seen it over and over. Joe's army, I've never seen it over a building ever. And even years later, he said, I've, I know it's, a call on many places, but I've never seen it with my eyes except for one place, that building in Grandview. I said, Joel, sorry. He says, yeah. He goes, you're going to Arrowhead Stadium. He goes, you know that, don't you? I said, yeah, Bob Jones, who you don't know yet. I go, Bob Jones. I go, he's different than you, Paul, so it's going to take a minute to kind of acclimate. You know, it's going to take a minute. <laughs> but, but he's real. Bob, Paul Kane was a gentleman, you know, he was a statesman, gentleman, and Bob Jones was overalls, and they were just different. And when they met each other, they were just like, hi, you know, good to know you, bro. <laughs> took a minute. It took a minute. <laughs> That's another story for another time. So he goes, no, you go to Arrowhead Stadium. He goes, Joel 2 is really important part of your destiny. You may not know that. Let's look at paragraph G which I call the Paul Cain's most repeated, most emphasized vision. That one and the Joel's army, and Joel's army raised up. Those are the two. Of course, they were one and the same. They were two distinct visions, but one reality. He saw them connected all the time. Look at paragraph G. I'm not going to read it, but he, he, I heard him give it many times. Every conference he went, nearly. That's exaggerated, but he gave it many places around the world. He goes, I saw like an open TV screen in front of me. He says, and the stadium was filled. And the anchor man was in the stadium, and he comes on the camera, and he says, there's no news but good news tonight. There are no sporting events to announce. For the stadiums, even around the world, are being filled up with these people. He goes, and on the stage, there's a company of people singing, and there's preachers and nobody knows who they are. They're near nameless and faceless. They, nobody knows them. They're not famous people at all. He says, and they stay on the stage. The announcer says, he goes, every time I saw the vision, they would go three days and three nights. One worship set, not two hours, three days. Without food, water, or change of clothing. He said they were supernaturally sustained and miracles are breaking out everywhere in the stadium. And the, and the anchor man goes, there's the dead being raised over there. There's blind eyes. There's limbs being restored over here. And the whole stadium would erupt. And Paul said there's like 100,000 on the inside. He doesn't know the real number. He goes, there's like 100,000 on the outside trying to get in. He goes, there's coming a moment, a time of the explosion of the glory of God. He goes, and the Lord... He says, I've seen this for 20, 30, 40 years. And when he walks on this parking lot, he sees Joel's army in training over this building. He says, you're going to Arrowhead. You know that, don't you? I said, yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, I do. I, you know, you, you wait so long, you still know you're going, but you just wonder, is it 36 years or 66 years? You know, you just don't know.
Paragraph H. When Paul Caden was in Kansas City one of his times, the Lord spoke to him. He said he heard it like thunder, the audible voice of the Lord. He said it came through my being like thunder. He said, to the church without mixture, I will give the spirit without measure. And he met me and he said, this is what the Lord is calling your people to. Lord, here we are. Let's just end with this. Let's pray. You can stand or sit, whatever. Lord, here we are. Here we are, Lord. I remember that hour so clearly when he came on this parking lot and he gave that word about the spirit without measure. He said, this is your destiny if you will take hold of it. Lord, here we are. Make this a private moment with the Lord. Here we are in our weakness. Lord, our proneness to get discouraged, our proneness to get weary in the assignment. But you delight in mercy. Your word says you delight in mercy. For you choose the weak things of the earth to magnify your power. Here we are, Lord, in our weakness. Zechariah 4, not by power, not by might, not human power, not human might. Yes, we have to obey. We have to keep signing up. But my spirit will energize you. My spirit will cover you. My spirit will cleanse you. My spirit will liberate you. I'll give you the words. I'll work the miracles. But you've got to say yes. And you can't draw back. And you can't quit. And when you're weary, you say yes to the grace of God. And you say yes again to my leadership, says the Lord. And I will move in you and through you and through your children and their children. And you will be a people of prayer and fasting. And dreams and visions will come. And your sons and daughters will operate in a spirit of power beyond anything that you've ever imagined. Father, we say yes to you. going to wait for a moment. Lord, I say this all the time to the Lord. Lord, how did I get in the middle of this? I'm a weak man. I've heard people over the years say, oh, we're not like Mike. They have this idea that I'm this A and B and C. I go, the problem is you are. I'm like you. We're all in it together. We're weak and broken and frail in our humanity. This isn't about tenacity. This is about the grace of God, but we have to keep signing up when we don't see it and when it doesn't feel right. And I, I mean, meaning it's hard is what I mean by it doesn't feel right. It's challenging and the time and the delay and somebody else gets promoted and somebody didn't treat you right. The Lord says, you can't quit. You can't quit. I don't mean being here. Quit pressing in for the purpose of God in this generation. We say thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So we're going to take about a 10-minute break, and we're going to come back and do our second session. Amen.